Hey, Chris Green, great to see you, brother. How are you? What is up, my friend? Good I to see you, Glenn. Always love it when you're on the show. Always love it when we get some one-on-one -on -one time without Anthony around here. But all right, let's get this show started. I'm Anthony. Welcome to No Vacancy Lives. That's my friend, Glenn. You're watching the number one show in hospitality. Hey, hey, everybody. Glenn Hausman here with the one and the only, the incredible Mr. Chris Green, CEO of Chesapeake Hospitality. You know, Chris loves to join our show from time to time. And Chris, it seems to me lately your days on seem to be when Anthony's got crazy stuff going on. Yeah, maybe, though, it's like Batman. Like, yeah. maybe I'm Wayne West and he's Batman. So maybe that's how this works. All right? <laughs> I love that. I, I really like what you're saying there. I think you're on to something. All right. So Anthony can't be here today. He's in the middle of a big, important meeting. You know, he starts working on some of these hotel projects. And interestingly enough, hotel investors and stuff don't respect sometimes that he has a hard, you know, a, a hard out from those meetings between 12 and 1 every day. So somehow, Chris, we're going to get by today. You know, we'll make it. We'll figure yeah. it out. All right, so um, I had the opportunity just the other day, uh, last week, as a matter of fact, to watch uh, Army of the Dead, right? So I was uh, very excited to be looking for like, oh, that's the showboat. That's the showboat. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> that was real. That was real fun. Yeah, yeah. It's a good place for filming. I mean, it's got a great backdrop. It's got yeah. so much space. So it was fun. The team yeah. had fun with it, so. Oh, I, I wish I could have been a, a part of it. I wish I knew. I want to go back in time like a year and a half, two years ago, whenever you guys filmed it and, and check that out. That would have been fun. I always wanted to be a zombie in a movie, Chris. I think you would be a good zombie. Right? I already have that dead look about me to begin with. Non-speaking role, like a non-speaking role for you. Yeah, right? <laughs> that would be great. Uh, hey, Matt says, good to see you. How's the season shaping up? Things going, things going yeah, well? Yeah, it's shaping up good. I mean, listen, we were, you know, we were just on with uh, commercial services a little while ago talking about outpacing the outpacing June. We're already ahead of our forecast for June. Oh, beautiful. Um, last four months of beat budget. So listen, it's all relative, right? It's we're still down, but it's mm -hmm. it's accelerating. And the accelerating is coming faster than expected, which is something that's beautiful. I love right. it. All right. We're going to bring out our guest in just one second, but uh, Colleen is saying still not notified. Yeah. I don't know what's going on, Colleen. I don't think it's you. I think it is Facebook that is uh, causing all those uh, troubles. So, Definitely Facebook. Definitely. Yeah, so, you know, sorry about that. I guess uh, Mark Zuckerberg is angry with me for something. I don't know. What did I do, Chris? What did I do? So, Glenn, before you uh, get the guest on, I heard I heard the topic today is something that I love. Is that true? Yeah. Uh, it is. It's uh, all going to be about the art of French cuisine. No, just kidding. Oh, good. Because I'm a, I'm a classically trained chef. Not. <laughs> no, we're going to be talking today about something that I know you're super passionate about, and that is creating an amazing corporate culture where people could really uh, thrive and customer service is alive, as our author of today says, right? That's awesome. Yeah. So let's bring him in. Uh, Mr. Charles Ryan Minton, author of this incredible book that I just recently read. Thanks for coming in today, uh, creating a culture where employees thrive and customer service is alive, just like I said. Ryan, man, great to see you, sir. Hey, thanks for having me. Thank you so much. Hey, and thanks for coming in today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, uh, so that's something that's uh, definitely a theme of yours throughout the entire book. But uh, Ryan, before we get into it, congratulations on putting pen to paper and making it from the start to the finish of this incredible project to put out a book. I mean, you. you must. I hope you're really super proud of you. I think it's really incredible anytime someone can take on this challenge because it's not a one or two day thing. These things could take a year plus. It did. I, and I appreciate you saying that. I, I think you said off air, it's weird to have a name on my, on a book. Yep. Uh, still feels like that. Um, uh, but it was a labor of love. I had to take some time off to do it. There was no way I could do it while being a GM. So I took some time off and, um, so happy that it was received so well. And, uh, very, very proud of it. Those yeah, things. and it, it has been received very well. I enjoyed it very much. Again, check it out at Amazon.com. Thanks for coming in today. That's thanks for coming in today, Amazon.com. And while you're at it, why not pick up a copy of The Adapters by Sean Worker and myself, Glenn Hausman. While you're at it, what the heck? It's too, you know, you, you'll do for one deal. It's just you got to pay twice the price. That's all. <laughs> 
<laughs> All right, so, uh, Ryan, this has like been a real cornerstone of, of what you um, are all about as a general manager. But before we get into that, Chris was saying that his numbers are great in June. You you just started at the Westin Fort Lauderdale a month ago. You're starting to see business coming back in a real meaningful way too, right? I would say roaring back down here in South Florida. We are uh, we had the best we had a a better May than May 2019. Think about mm -hmm. that pre COVID. Wow. Uh, Ninety percent occupancy in the month of May. Uh, Going to probably do about uh, 80 85 percent here in June. So it's 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 busy down here. Wow. I mean, Glenn, if you look around the Florida markets, I mean, Tampa last weekend was completely sold out. Uh, Fort Lauderdale, Miami was close to capacity. Orlando, close to capacity. All of the uh, resort hotels were close to capacity. So, I mean, there's so much pent up demand that it's just unbelievable. And in locations where like Ryan is, it's just going to continue to be busy. Yeah. Um. So one of the stories that are emerging this week, guys, um, is – group business seems to be coming back. We had Ted Darnall on from uh, AGI Hotels and Resorts a couple of days ago, and he was saying they're running now because their portfolio focuses a lot on urban projects, kind of like uh, you, Chris, mm -hmm. plazas and stuff like that. Um, he's seeing about 50% of what they're accustomed to with group business already. And further, I was speaking to the good folks over at Nolan yesterday, and they're seeing a 60% surge so far this year in meetings, particularly in that under 200 category, which is the real bread and butter in the industry. Uh, Chris, how are you saying it? Yeah, I, it's funny. We were just talking about that today. Our pace is so strong for the back half of the year. Mm -hmm. And I think it has to do with what we talked about for so long, Glenn, is once somebody breaks the seal. Yep. So, so listen, meeting planners are also leisure travelers, right? So they've probably taken a short trip with their family or whatever. And they've thought, oh, my gosh, we can go now. Let's go. And that's what's happening. People are like, if we can, go, if we can go, let's get a meeting together because that's how a lot of people make their livings, make their contacts. Mm -hmm. And so we're seeing huge. I was actually reviewing transactions in our portfolio today, and our hotel in downtown Pittsburgh, the group demand is way, way up over the past few weeks. Wow, that's awesome. And Ryan, you've only been at your hotel a month now. You mm -hmm. were brought in as a specialist because. They want you for your your work on creating amazing cultures over there. But what is before we get into all of that? How are you feeling right now, getting into a new property and seeing this surge in business potentially well into the fall, like Chris is saying? Well, I mean, I'm very even though I'm new here. I'm very familiar with the market. I was at the Marriott on the other side of the highway. Um, and, and and in response to what you're saying about group, literally yesterday just posted group sales manager position because um, as everyone we we scaled back obviously most of our staff i mentioned to you earlier we're at 50 percent mm -hmm. yep. of what we typically would have on on staff and my sales team right now is two when typically it would be six Whew. so uh we just posted that group sales manager position so if you're watching and uh you want to get to south <laughs> florida and you're a great group sales manager please uh Please apply. So yeah, yeah we're, but, we're uh, seeing seriously that. though. Um, if you guys do want to apply, they're actually holding a job fair at, at his hotel. Today. Yeah, it's happening it's downstairs lot. right now. Right. So there's a lot of jobs available over mm -hmm. there. Um, Ryan, how can people connect with you? Do you have a, an email or a website you want to send them to? LinkedIn's awesome, obviously, uh, and then also uh, Ryan at RyanMenton.com. Right. And uh, he's under the name Ryan, but because uh, he's a fancy author now, he's Charles <laughs> Ryan uh, Minton. So let's get into it, man. Let's talk about your book. Let's talk about customer service. Um, I love that you start off um, early on before you really became who you are today as a more fully formed uh, professional. What was that journey like for you, understanding the importance of having a healthy culture in the workplace environment? even before you had the opportunity to affect change of culture? Well, I think it's all about where you start. And I was lucky enough to start for an awesome GM mm -hmm. um, and an awesome company, Weingartner and Hammonds. Um, they, uh, I think, are now more pyramid hotel group. Yep. But uh, I had an amazing general manager, Brian Perkins, who just modeled what a great culture was. And so that's all I knew until I went somewhere else and I thought, Wow, not every place is like this. Right. So it it took going elsewhere to see that not everywhere is the same. So um, I model a lot of who I am, what I do by those first, you know, that first hotel job I had. 
Yeah. And that's kind of where the name of the book from. And Michael Weinberg says the story of how you got the title is awesome. He'd love to hear it again. I'm sure there's oh. a lot of people out there like our entire audience that hasn't. So maybe you could share a little bit about that because I think it really provides great insights as to what's formed you and your point of view. First of all, I think I'm just humbled that someone chimed in that they know the story. Oh my God. <laughs> That's freaking cool. <laughs> I uh, yeah, that. you know. The one thing before you start, it's so weird. You do these things, you communicate with people all the time, you write these books, you do videos and stuff like that. And a lot of us just feel like it goes into the ether, into a vacuum. And anytime somebody actually says they listen to you or read what you said, it's really a bizarre out of body yeah. experience, right? It is. It's awesome. Yeah. And I, and I appreciate him saying, that. um, yeah, so I, I love telling the story, um, why I called the book. Thanks for coming in today. Um, at that first hotel that I referenced, I uh, was in Cincinnati. It was a Marriott full service Marriott in, uh, Northern Cincinnati. That's where I'm from. I think you can see that Bengals helmet back there. Go Bengals. Yeah. <laughs> uh, lifelong suffering Bengals fan. Hey, I'm a Jet um, fan. I understand. Yes. Uh, they had Boomer, Boomer Esiason for a little while. Um, so, there is a young man. First of all, I, I was so lucky. I inherited, I was a front office manager. I inherited a rock star front office team. Uh, as you know, most brands, uh, Medallia, GSS, mm -hmm. you know, all those customer service scores are measured. And, and this particular team just week after week was just number one in all front desk measurables out of 315 Marriott's rival experience, problem resolution, departure experience. So I, 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 there was an incredible team, but there was one young man on the team that just really stood out. And his name was Jason. At the time, Jason was a hospitality student, um, was wrapping up his, his hospitality degree, wanted to be a GM. And um, Jason would come into work every day with this just incredible amount of energy, um, like off the charts. Uh, he would typically work the, the second shift. Mm -hmm. And um, he would come in. I always joke that he had to be in the parking lot pounding Red Bulls because that's like just how much energy you couldn't even contain it. And uh, he would come in, he would find me, <clears throat> excuse me, no matter where I was at. Mm -hmm. And uh, he would just give me this gripping handshake and he'd say, Ryan, thanks for coming in today. And it was always really funny because, you know, obviously I was his leader, his manager. So I should probably be thinking him, but you know, he was a, a, a GSR a, at GSA and he was, he was thanking me for coming in. And um, Jason would do this with every person he encountered guests, other departments. He'd go up to housekeepers. He'd go into laundry. Hey guys, thanks for coming in today. And, um, and it was just, it was just really, it was, it was really cool um, when he would do that. And so I had the opportunity as I moved up my career to bring Jason on board as my front office manager mm -hmm. at another hotel. And um, it wasn't long after I brought him on board that um, I, I got a really difficult phone call in the middle of the night that Jason had been killed in a car accident. Right. And uh, I'll never forget that call. His fiance called me. It was like three in the morning. And um, I hung up the phone and I, I remember so clearly, I remember thinking, I'm going to miss Jason telling me, thanks for coming in today. Right. And why am I, why would I think of that? Why would I miss that? Um, and I think, and I know the reason is that whenever Jason would say that to me, I remember how it made me feel. It made me feel like I mattered. And I, I grasped onto that because I, I want other people to feel that way. I want other people to feel like they matter. And so at that moment, I committed to, I want to keep this going. I want to, um, I want to make sure people around me feel the way Jason made me feel. And so I started doing what Jason did. Hey, thanks for coming in today. And I've done it throughout my entire career. Um, and I, I always say, you know, whenever I take over a new hotel or we get a new employee and I, first time I say it, Hey, thanks for coming in today. I always get some initial, um, funny responses of, you know, yeah, I'm on the schedule or, of course, I'm here. You know, why wouldn't I be? You're paying me to be here, and uh, I end up I end up sharing that story in some shape or form. But also, I my point in it is that, you know, every employee has a choice when they wake up to come to work or not, and I genuinely appreciate as a GM when they come to work. 
especially right now. We have <laughs> half, half the staff you need. We have half the staff. So <laughs> when, you know, when the barista decides to, you know, oversleep and not come to work, that impacts so many different things. It impacts the guests, of course. It impacts another department because someone's running over to try to cover. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I am, uh, and the book really kicks off and, and talks about how important it is to show genuine appreciation to your employees. Um, because I really believe that, that that's the foundation for creating a great, um, a great culture is that right. employees feel valued. And so um, that, that's where thanks for coming in today comes from. That's beautiful. And the book is dedicated to him as well. It is. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Chris, what do you think? Uh, I think it's super powerful and it's not surprising you've seen great success in your career leading this way. I, I would, I would, I would ask you to share some of the, what are some of the throughputs or the results you've seen? Not, not financially necessarily, Ryan, but, but on just kind of on a, a personal level, leading teams in this fashion, because I think it's fascinating. I think it's something that needs to be talked about. Well, I always find when I take over a new property, I've, uh, this is my fifth GM right. uh, stent, all full service Marriott's for the most part. Um, I'm always struck by me just being myself. I, I'm, I'm hoping this comes across humbly because I do not mean it any other way. Um, and how employees react to me just talking to them, just mm literally uh interacting with them on a daily basis knowing their name in some cases um I, I i don't know how gms don't do that but apparently it does happen um so i i found that immediately it's it's when you start going into an, a new property and you make time and you are intentional and i talk about this in the book you have to be intentional mm -hmm. about visiting every department every day because it is so easy for me to get sucked into this office. Um, so easy. Um, so I, you have to be intentional about making your rounds, saying hello, shaking hands. Good morning. How are you doing? Thanks for coming in today. Um, that starts to really change the feel, um, you know, of how the place feels. And then it starts right. to get contagious, right? Other, other leaders start to model it. Um, but to me, it's really, um, it's really the the basis of how you start to chip away at changing a culture is just being present. I don't know yeah. if that answered your question, but no, no, that's but, great. But, but but Chris, what's interesting about what he's saying with that story is that when you're out there and you're talking to people all the time, you really get to know them. So you can really understand and detect what's really happening at the staff level <clears throat> before situations can get out of hand and you either lose somebody or whatever, whatever. Uh, is that is that right, Ryan? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, we're, especially now, I mean, half the staff um, that we should probably have and everybody's going through something right now. Yeah. Um, and and uh, we're all humans. We're all we're all we all have life outside of here. Um, and to be able to to know that and know what's going on with everybody mm -hmm. outside of these walls really, um, really helps your um, helps you manage, helps you, you know, approach the day. Um, and I talk a little bit about that too in the book is, you know, it's, is understanding what everybody's going through. Um, if, if someone just, you know, if someone just lost their dog and, and, and you're putting them up at the front desk, I mean, oh, right. it, you know, you have to be aware of what's going on. Yeah. I have a story, Glenn, if I could share a quick story that changed, really changed the trajectory of how I, I you know, how I led. I was a young leader in a hotel a long time ago, and I was uh, fascinated with being busy. I was always, everybody's busy, like like Ryan saying, back and forth. I was a department head running back and forth to one department to another. And I was always friendly. I've always been friendly, but I didn't realize the impact of listening and true engagement had on leadership until I was walking through the lobby one day, and I walked past one of our housekeeping associates, and I was on my way somewhere with a mission to be accomplished. And I said, Good morning, good morning, how are you? And I kept walking. And she said, she said, do you really care? Right. But but that that story changed the way I listened for the rest of my career. And I think that I still know her. She's worked for us for over 25 years. Um, 
But I, she changed the way I thought about listening and taking time to get engaged. And really, it, it helped shape my leadership for the past 25 years. What happened in that moment when she said, do you really care? What did I, re you at that I realized I wasn't placing the importance that needed to be in place on those true human relationships. Because as Ryan knows, those, the, those relationships are what matter. The, the engagement the team has with the leader of the hotel or lack of – will be purely and 100% reflected on the performance of that hotel, so. Right, uh, and that's, that's so interesting that you learned those lessons about, uh, you learned that lesson, and she must have really been upset to even say something like that, right? Yeah, she had something going on that, you know, there was the typical, the typical, hey, how you doing kind of thing, and, and it just wasn't good enough that day. It, it didn't show genuine care and concern for the associate, and it was just, Honestly, it was embarrassing. I, the way I was raised was different to treat people and value people. And I was not, I was letting the job or what I thought perceived back then was the job take over what really is the job, which is caring for other humans, whether it's guests or associates. That's our job as leaders. All right, so how do you guys balance the time then, Chris, from when you were on the property level and even as the you know chief executive of a company and, and Ryan, you too, when you were on the property level, because you can spend all day talking to people, but you actually have other stuff you probably have to do as well. So how do you find the time to balance everything without being on property 24 hours a day, Ryan? Well, a big thing for me is um, trusting my my leaders, um, you know, putting right pe people in the right place, obviously. Um, but uh, I, I, I go back to that word intentional. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I intentionally try to spend the first hour and a half, two hours sometimes in the morning mm -hmm. in the lobby, marble duty, whatever you want to call it. Um, I try to get to the hotel by seven, seven thirty, and I just make make my rounds. And I don't I don't allow myself in here. Uh, it's come right. up, drop the keys off, put the name tag on, and 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 hit the hit the hit the road. So um, I, I think a big part of it is being intentional, and then just it, how you structure your day. So after that happens, that leads into our nine o'clock stand up every morning in the lobby. All the departments are there. You know, we talk about the day. What do we have going on? And then after that stand up, I allow myself to come in here until around lunchtime. And then it's all right, let's take another walk. Let's go swing by the break room, say hello. Um, so I think I think it's a lot of just how you structure your day. Yeah, makes sense. Chris, uh, that, that makes sense to me, structuring your day in that right way. But how do you see it differently now that you're not on the property level? How do you try to make those personal interactions at the corporate level, especially well, if you're not in the office every day? Well, no, and, and that's a difficult thing, but I, I prioritize hotel visits too. My, my schedule is built around visiting our, our field associates and when I'm there visiting the team. And honestly, I don't, I don't put meetings on the schedule for those visits. Very, very few meetings. I might meet with the ownership of the hotel, but most of the time is spent engaging with our associates at the hotel. So they understand, you know what our culture is about at Chesapeake, and they understand that they matter most. Um, and so... Ryan's right on the head, being intentional. And with the corporate people, I mean, through the pandemic, being intentional about one-on-ones and doing, you know, Zoom meetings is great. But I'm so excited that I'm back seeing humans in person. Yeah. And, and we're planning our, our first corporate meeting, all corporate meeting here in about uh, four weeks. So we're getting back together and spending time. And we don't just spend time driving through numbers, right? That's not what we do. We spend time talking about this has been hard. How's everybody doing? Get bringing in some coaching for them on how to pass out of it from one stage to another, investing in our people. Because of all the times I, I used to really think when I was a young manager, and Ryan, you know, you'll get this the PL is what matters, and that the PL is not what matters. I mean, if the investors are listening to me today, that's great. But here's the deal the PL will be a byproduct of amazing leadership and care and concern for associates. That's all it is, is a byproduct. Right. Yeah, actually, you know, when you say that, uh, first of all, I love that you said that. Uh, second of all, um, I, I, I say this all the time, you know, as a GM, wear a lot of hats. Mm -hmm. The department heads, they wear a lot of hats, especially now. I mean, I'm doing things as a GM that <laughs> I hadn't done in a few well, years. Sure. Um, Relearning a lot of things. Um, but out of everything that I do, and I, I believe this in my whole heart, and it's why I love being a GM. Uh, out of everything that I do, I believe the most important responsibility that I have 
is to create an environment where people genuinely want to come to work. And that's why I love this industry. That's why I love this business. It's such a diverse group of people that work here. Um, everybody's working here for a different reason. Um, you have employees that are literally supporting two, three people at home. You have people that are here just for a part-time job because they want a travel benefit. You have uh, salary managers that have made this their career. Um, everybody is from a different place. Um, and I just feel that if I can create an environment where any of these people want to come to work every day and I can make this the best eight, nine, 10, some cases, 16 hours yeah. <laughs> of their day, the best, then, then, then I'm, then I'm winning and everything else falls into place. I can provide, I can provide great customer service. That great customer service is going to yield financial results, repeat customers, repeat guests. Um, I, I just, I just believe that with my whole heart. If you can, if I can get the employee part right, everything else falls into place, including the PNL. Yeah, that's uh, that's exciting. And once again, we're talking about the book. Thanks for coming in today, where you really can create great culture. And one of the things that in creating a culture of success, you have it broken down into five different uh, segments. Uh, the thanks for coming in today, which we talked about. First impressions matter. Set the bar lead, don't manage, and treat your employees like customers. Chris, that sound like it makes sense to you? Makes total. I can't wait to get my hands on the book. I wish I had had a chance I to know. read it beforehand. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. super the last minute, everybody who's watching. So if Chris doesn't know something, my fault. <laughs> no, it's okay. It's okay. But I want to commend Ryan too. I've I've over the years had a bunch of ideas about writing a book and I've always let you know work get in the way. But congratulations. I mean, that must have been a big commitment on your on your you know, on your point to just make that happen. What, what was the genesis where you said, I have to write this down? What was the genesis? Um, I think it was after the second, yeah, it was after my second hotel and going in and just being myself and doing what I do um, and seeing the results and feeling like what I was doing was normal, but, but it wasn't apparently that what yeah. I was doing was not typical. Right. Um, based on feedback that I was getting. Um, and and I, I I wanted to share it, but also um, I really wanted to tell the story about Jason. Uh, yeah. I, and I and that's what I honestly most proud of about this, uh, being able to write the book is um, so many people have heard Jason's story um, and have reflected back to me what it meant, what it meant to hear about Jason. Um, pretty wild. I, I wasn't expecting to go into this, but um, Right before COVID, I was speaking at an event back in Cincinnati. Uh, it was for a casino. Mm -hmm. And um, I started this, the, the talk just like I always do, telling that story. And um, I put a picture on the screen of that team that I referenced uh, so I can point out what Jason looks like. And I put that screen up there and I pointed to Jason and a woman in the back of the audience said, oh, my God, that's my son. Oh, my God. And... I just, I froze. I didn't, you know, right. Glenn, you do keynote speaking. You don't typically, you don't typically hear that. I've gotten yeah. used to dealing with a lot on stage, but yeah. that one would throw uh, off. Yeah. Everybody. And so um, at that moment, I mean, I just decided, all right, I have to get off stage and explain to her what I'm about to do. Cause most of my talk is around her son. I never met Jason's mom. Of what, right. Why would you have? Right. And um, it ended up being incredible. I've got some cool pictures um, and we now are we, we stay connected. Um, I'm sure she personally thinks it's a really beautiful thing that you've modeled a lot of what you do based on him and his attitude and stuff like that, even dedicating yeah. the book to him. Yeah. And what she shared with me was that, you know, and at that point, Jason had uh, passed away, gosh, 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, and she said there was a void that 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 she didn't know needed to be filled when she heard the story. Cause she didn't know she had no idea. Right. Um, and so for me, I, I mean, I'm a big believer in everything happens for a reason. Of course. And, I, yeah. and I, I think it was part of this, this process and journey to write this book so that I could provide that for her. So what do you mean in the book um, uh, with first impressions matter? And I don't want you to go through everything in the book because we really want people to go to Amazon.com and buy. Thanks for coming in today. But give us a we could do a, we could do a, a yeah, fireside a chat. I could just yeah. read it to you. <laughs> <laughs> 
No, actually, it's it's probably one of the more important things right now um, that we just talked about. Um, I have a talent recruiter that works for our company. Uh, this is TPG Hotels and Resorts. And uh, we have a talent recruiter that's based here and uh, handles another run of our South Florida properties. Um, and we were just able to bring her back on. A lot, a lot of, you know, staff was, you know, furloughed. And so um, when I first impressions matter, it's twofold. One is obviously guest related. So let's talk about the employee side of it. Mm -hmm. um, we're all right now just desperately trying to find talent. And I think everybody needs to take a moment and look at when you find someone, right? What does that process look like? Because in a lot of cases, and, and I'll and I'll be very transparent, we we have some work to do that we're we're doing right now. Where that process well, you're allowed to be transparent. You've only been there a month. So you're in the process yeah, of making Yeah, there's a lot that process is broken a lot of times. Um mm -hmm. in terms of what does onboarding look like? What does an employee's first day look like? and how important that is to get that right. Um, there was a stat that I used pre-COVID and I'm sure it's a lot different now, it's probably worse um, when I would speak that um, half the employees that quit their job last, uh, well, this would have been 2019, half the employees that left their job that year did so in the first 90 days. Right. And I think that happens because they get, they're so excited, they get hired, they got a job and then they get in and they realize it sucks. So <laughs> they're, they're out. Right. So I, I again, I keep using the word intentional it must be the theme of the day, but um, intentional about the on uh, the first day. Um, I always I always blown away when an, when a department head is desperate for an employee and we find one and they schedule them on their off day, their first day on their off day. Like right. so many things can go wrong with that. Um, so so that's something that I talk a lot about is. A, as a department head, you need to be there for their first day, their whole shift. Um, and little things, Glenn, like just, you know, having a welcome packet. Right. Um, sounds small, but with their name tag already made, how many of us forgot that the employees started a, we're running around, they spend their whole shift without a name tag until somebody knows how to make it, can make it. Right. Um, you know, we don't have their time card ready. Right. You know, and again, these are th these are things I'm self reflecting on right no, now. But totally, because it it makes it important. Yeah. Don't seem that it's together. And mm -hmm. honestly, you've got me thinking back to some of those first jobs I had on that first day where you go in and everything is there, and it makes you feel welcome. It makes yeah, you feel absolutely. part of the, the community, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, how you're awesome. received is 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 such a big part of yeah. uh, you know how you're going to, you know, A, stick around, but B, how you're going to feel about that company. And look, it's also signaling. It's it's everything you do is signaling certain things. And to me, it's right. signaling, wow, if they're intentional about this for me, um, then they're probably intentional about taking care of guests. That's probably important. So yeah. it's kind of a side, you know, product of that. Totally. Uh, Chris, uh, he said one word that I I know you've said before, I feel like you have, but it definitely feels like it's all about you. Intentional, right? Yeah. Well, I love, I mean, you know, Ryan's right on with the stats. I could actually, we, I talked to him with HR about all the time. In 19, you know, I think, unfortunately, as, as hard as we work, I think about 55% of our people that turned over, turned over in the first 90 days. And I always like to turn that whole situation around and, and look at it from this point of view. When an, it used to drive me crazy when a dark department head would come in and say, I'm short staffed. When I know they were staffed two months ago, and my number one question is, what happened to your people? Mm -hmm. Why weren't we caring? Where did they go? Like, what did we, instead of looking outside, look at ourselves and say, what did we do that we now we have a shortage of associates? What did we as leaders do to not provide an environment where people felt welcome? And I love your term, Ryan, signaling. I think also when you welcome people appropriately, you signal what the rest of their career journey could be like. Mm -hmm. if, if, if your first day is a hot mess, what do you think the rest of your job is going to be like? What's your confidence level in your department head or the GM or the corporate office? Who knows? Well, and, and my message to everyone here so far, because we are desperate for folks to join our team and, and look, we could get into that. I know you've done it on other shows, Glenn, uh, why we're having trouble finding people, mm -hmm. but my gosh, the people that we have, let's, let's freaking take care of them. Let's make sure <laughs> they are enjoying coming to work. Um, because we, you know, I was just talking to another GM down here the other day 
And I don't know that this is necessarily a new thing, but maybe it just feels more real now than it did before COVID. But we're always one person away from pure hell. <laughs> like right. if, if someone quits today in a particular position, it can get ugly quickly. Right. Um, so again, it goes back to, wow, you know, make sure you're taking care of the people that you have. Um, and that was something that I had written down uh, before the show. You know, everybody's talking about pay rates, mm -hmm. increasing pay rates. Great. It, it needs to happen. But as a GM and if, if you're, you know, you're watching and you're not, you know, above the GM level or, or any of that, we don't have, I mean, I can certainly make a recommendation of what I think it needs to be, but in the day that's, that's probably not my decision. So I can only focus on what I can control. Mm -hmm. And that, that is how do my employees feel? How, do, how do they feel taken care of? How do they feel cared for? Um, that, that's what I consume myself with. Right. Awesome. So I'm going to make a little reference to our show from Tuesday, June 8th. Please go check that show where we had Harris Rosen and his team on to discuss how they take care of their employees. And I'm speaking about medically now. They actually have their own uh, medical facilities that they put together, their own insurance. And employees basically don't have to pay anything for any real health check visits and stuff like that. In fact, they are paid on the clock to go and get to go get preventative care and stuff like that, that sort of move has engaged these employees and they've got one of the industry's lowest turnover rates because of that. So I think Charles, something like uh, Ryan, that goes really down to what you've been saying, but I want to get into some of the other stuff that you've been, uh, you've been talking about. Treat your employees like customers, lead, don't manage those kinds of uh, philosophies. How do you see, how do you see that? So the biggest thing I talk about with uh, treat your cost, your employees like customers, um, the I love the the mopless story. I, I I can't take credit for it. I heard it somewhere, um, and who knows how much of it is true, but it does paint a great picture. Um, the story is that there was a hotel somewhere that the employees became so disengaged that they wanted to unionize, mm -hmm. and so um, as they begin to dig into what led them to be so disengaged that they're so un unhappy with um, leadership, and as they put, peel back the onion a little bit, they started to, to go all the way back to a long-term housekeeper, public space attendant who had been there forever. Um, and she asked the executive housekeeper for a new mop. Mm -hmm. And the executive housekeeper said, no, it wasn't in the budget. Well, I'm sure we all know how much a mop costs. It's a right. couple bucks. Right. And so what I've seen happen sometimes is Somewhere way up here, it's we need to cut, cut, cut. And so that starts to filter all the way down because the message keeps getting pushed down mm -hmm. to the property level where it's literally we cannot buy a mop. And the mop is one of the most important tools that a public space attendant needs. And right. it costs nothing. And so um, I cute. I share that story and I and I always um I, and we're doing it now. Like I said, I've been here a month. Uh, I've got a folder in my email that says mop list. And <laughs> I ask all the department managers, right. what is on your department's mop list? Right. What are the things that the employees are asking for? And inevitably, guys, it always ends up being things that really don't cost a lot of money. Um, almost every hotel I go to, the front desk always wants new printers. Um, housekeepers always need new vacuums. And these are things that you can do right away that, again, use the word signal, signal that you're investing in them and that you care about the employees. Um, and I think I, I share this in the book is, you know, you wouldn't hesitate to do a little something extra for a, a guest, for a, a repeat guest, if you knew that they needed something right. that was going to make their experience better. Why aren't we doing that with our employees? So um, it's, that's really that's really what the point of the you know, the mop list is. And so every month at staff meeting, I say, how are we doing on our mop list guys? And you know, what is it? And I tell everybody up front, I can't get everything right away, but I can promise you that we're going to whittle away at this list and get the things that are causing pain points for our employees. Because uh, guess what? I, I also believe this very, very strongly. Our employees, when they come to work every day, there is much as we want to believe the brand right. wants to believe 
they're not coming in here every day to make the Weston look amazing. <laughs> like that is not their sole mission when they come into work, even though we want to feel that way. Right. They're, if you've hired the right people, and that's a whole nother conversation, if you hired service minded individuals, they're coming in because they, they genuinely want to give good service. It's a, it's, it's their reputation on the line. It's their personal brand. And if you're not giving people the tools they need to do the job, the basic tools to do their job, you're messing with their personal brand. And I've seen this, I've seen employees who will quit because they weren't giving tools to be successful and it's just making their life more difficult. Right. And they're going to, you know, they, they'll go to the next hotel or the next whatever down the street because they know that, um, they have a good, you know, China glass silver inventory or whatever it is they need, right, yeah. to, you know, for an extra quarter an hour or whatever. So I, I just think it's so important that um, when we talk about treating employees like customers, that we're giving them what they need, just like we would give a customer what they need. Beautiful. Chris. That's brilliant. No, I'm taking notes. I'm taking notes from Ryan. I love it. I love what he has to say. I, I, I use the term making magic for what he's talking about. And that's how leaders and hotels can listen for the needs of their people. Mm -hmm. And if you're if you're engaged in doing what Ryan's doing, walking around the hotel every day, talking to people, knowing what's going on, knowing where they're missing a mop or, or a, a vacuum and you're listening and you're also listening to your sales team on the successes they're having. When you can, as the GM, say, get the mops, get the get this. I mean, it literally creates magic in your hotel because people are like, wow, I'm going to be able to do my job. And then they're happy. And then the salespeople are happy. The hotel is cleaner. The guests are happy. All of a sudden, sales go up. And guess what? You can buy more vacuums. It's buy not, more mops. <laughs> it's not rocket science what we do, but it takes changing because, listen, I'm, I'm guilty of it. What do you think the first thing we did when the pandemic hit? Cut, mm -hmm. right? Right. And, and the problem is with that message is, is if Chris Green says cut, by the time it works through our organization and it's at the executive housekeeper in Detroit, it's like, Exactly as Ryan said, don't buy anything ever. And that's not the truth. Right. I constantly, Glenn, have to tell people when I say cut, that means thoughtfully. We never impact the guest experience or the associate experience, period. You know, and we never put people at safety risk. But that message doesn't make it all the way through, right? That's the challenge. And so that's one of the questions I had for Ryan is why, Ryan, do you think, I mean, it's obviously you've got it, but why do you think so many department heads and quite frankly, GMs in the field don't understand this. What, what is it? I think um, that's a great question. I never really thought about it too much, but I would say a lot of it has to do with just taking that message that you shared, Chris, to, at, its, at its face value and not understanding how to run their business, um, you know, thoughtfully is... All I know is, and maybe it goes back to something you said earlier about the P and L, you know, we get so wrapped up in that, that financial statement and consume with how it's going to read that we, we just start wanting to cut everything that we can to, to deliver the best, the best statement that we can. And, and, and not understanding as, as, as a business leader that, you know, buying the, buying those little things does not have that major impact or swing either way. Right. Yeah. Um, and so I think that could be part of it for sure. And I think it's years of honestly tough leadership. And this is more of, it's a bigger discussion, but it's, it's some of the leaders have come through the past, you know, nine 11 and then through the financial crisis. And so the, a lot of leaders were raised in the cut, cut, cut mentality and unfortunately, if that's the way they learned or if they were, quite frankly, and Ryan knows this, there's so many different management companies and styles of leadership that if you were with a company where it was all about the P&L mm -hmm. and you didn't get exposed to, to how culture drives profitability, then that's what you learn. And it's not really wrong, but I just think we could have a renaissance if we could get so many leaders in our industry understanding this concept mm -hmm. that it's, it's not that hard to do and it produces amazing results. <laughs> Well, I, I think that this maybe falls under the category of people not being curious enough about what they don't know that they don't know. Uh, maybe that's something fundamentally we have to, uh, to think about, getting people to think differently and be open to new ideas. We all get in our own head because we've done things this way. Is so That's the way we got to do things. So how do you go about getting people to start to open their mindset up to new ideas so they'll be receptive to making proactive change? Anyone want to jump on that one first? 
I mean, listen, I, I, you know, I haven't, I'm not in the field anymore, but I did, I was in nine different cities as a GM. And so I had a lot of experience taking over new hotels and I would always have to kind of ask the team to trust me. I said, if you will just buy in and let me show you the outcome uh, of what can be done by just changing a few things about how we care for people and how we do things, the results will, will blow you away. And you can go back and check with former team members of mine. They've made the biggest bonuses they ever had working with me. It's not nothing I did. It's right. that they bought into doing this system, right? Take your eyes off the PL and put your eyes on your people. And the rest is an outcome. And it continues to bear fruit. That's the way we run Chesapeake. That's the way we run our corporate infrastructure at Chesapeake. We talk about people first and the outcomes will be what they are. Right. Um, I just don't see how you can have a great culture and a poor outcome financially. I don't see how those two would line up. Agree. So. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That, that makes sense. And this goes to, a, I think, a larger issue that we have in society where we don't look at root causes of issues. We slap Band-Aids on problems and then move on to the next thing. I think that's what the whole Six Sigma idea was about that's kind of fallen out of fashion lately. But figuring out, go as far back as you can and figure out if you can make the change at the beginning of whatever process it is or, or et cetera, et cetera, that will then change absolutely everything. Uh, Ryan, we're starting to get low on time and I, I've got a couple more questions for you and I don't want you to give away all your book, but your whole second half of the book is on winning customer experience strategies. Give us one salient thought that kind of puts us in the head of what you were thinking when you wrote this and a good example about it. Well, uh, again, the chunk of the book is about that employee experience. That's why the, the second part's a little bit smaller. Maybe I'll write another book on just customer experience but i just again i think that's so important um i think one cool thing um one little story i'll share from the, from the book um is uh the part where i talk about uh bpa blow people away this is a concept that um that i um got from a uh, a high-end restaurant group in cincinnati mm -hmm. um i went to dinner one night and uh was with a group of people and I'll tell you long. I will tell you the story. It's a long story, but long story <laughs> short, we'll, we'll be in another 30 minutes. Uh, uh, hey, listen, buy the book, get the whole yeah, story. Exactly. But long story short, something happened that blew me away yeah. as a customer. Mm -hmm. And so, and I decided to write the book. I remembered this happened. So I, I went and met with the chef owner of this restaurant group. Group is growing up, is blowing up. They have, I don't know how many restaurants now. And um, I want to know how, how did this moment happen that I had this great experience? And he, uh, shared with me that when he became um, an owner of his own restaurant, that he was so scared of screwing up that he started telling anybody that would work for him, we have to blow people away. We have to blow people away and um, shortened it to BPA. And he shared that his single reason that his restaurants are successful and why they are known for great service is because every employee is indoctrined into this BPA philosophy is what they call it, blow mm -hmm. people away. And they look for opportunities, specific opportunities to blow people away. And so um, every, and you know, you hear about this with other brands, you know, I don't know how, I've never worked for Ritz Carlton, I don't know what it is now, but you know, you hear they have up to like $2,000, they can do right. whatever, I don't know what it is, but uh, um, same concept. I mean, that the, these their servers, they listen, they look for opportunities, and then they capitalize on it. Um, in my situation, it was a situation where they had made a note on a previous reservation that I loved fried pickles. And I this is a high end restaurant, they don't serve fried pickles. I don't even know how it came up. But months later, they served me without me ever asking a plate of fried pickle chips. Fun. And it was like, how did you know that? And they use, you know, customer intelligence that so that's awesome. So yeah, BPA, blow people away. Look, look, that's what I talk to my team about all the time. Look for opportunities to blow people away. Chris, what do you think about that? I love it. And the, the, here's the challenge. And I, I don't doubt for a minute, Ryan does it, but the challenge is it's one thing to say it. It's another thing to support it as the GM. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you can say you have, you have the full authority to take care of the guests, but then the very second that somebody does something, maybe a little bit more than you expected, it's it, as the GM, you're faced right then with a choice. Do you, do you, you know, commend them for a great job or do you uh, get onto them for spending $15 too much or, you know, sending them in a town car instead of a cab? I mean, this is, it, it, this is where the rubber meets the road. I apologize. This is where the rubber meets the road in leadership is understanding the value of what was happening. 
right then. And then making sure that you can't say, hey, take care of the guests and then pull the reins back. I mean, there has to be some guidelines, but ultimately it's about how you handle those situations. And I mm -hmm. think empowerment is only empowerment if it's There's real. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the word I was like. I think we're both trying to get to that one word that we I didn't use, but uh, empowerment. Well, you did in yeah. chapter six of your book, empower yeah. your people. Yeah, I mean it's there, but yeah. we have that we have that conversation all the time. And one mm. of the things that I constantly say is, how do you empower people? I mean, how do you really empower people, or just convince yourself that you're you're doing that? So the, those particular stories that you're sharing here really helps us visualize how we can make some major changes uh, uh, in, in the future. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. All right, so um, before we wrap up, a little switch of a, of a, of a question. Michael Weinberg is, uh, is curious, um, why is there a reluctance to hire remote salespeople? Not all markets can be, you know, can be handled this way, but some can. Either of you have perspective on, on this? I, I admittedly probably don't have a lot of perspective on it. Yeah, I, I, have, I have some, so I don't have any issue with it. We, I mean, I don't think, I think that you've got to be, well, listen, if you're not a forward thinking company in today's market, you're going to have a hard time finding the right people. And we want the A list performers. So I have a, a sales manager that's in Charleston, uh, South Carolina, sells um, South Georgia, Atlanta, and North Carolina, and she crushes. I that's mean, awesome. So does she have to do a lot of uh, trips to do she that? She does when she has site visits. She has, you know, people coming in for site visits. She has to travel to the hotels. But I mean, she's producing basically the same results as an on-property sales manager, but at three properties. So think about the economy of scale there. So she's having the success as three sales managers would typically have, and you only have to spend a little bit of extra money to get her to go back and forth from those properties. Seems yeah. like a reasonable trade-off to me. For the right people, absolutely. I mean, it's just, listen, we got to break out of some things that we've just never done before. And so, but we've been doing it for a while. She's been working for us for a while. Yeah. Uh, for sure. So Ron, are you doing something you've never done before at this particular property one month in? I mean, you know, we talk a lot about on the show how we hit the great reset button because of the of COVID on this show. So are you going to try anything new, different, fundamentally uh, strange? <laughs> I wouldn't say I haven't done anything fundamentally strange. Um, I, I like to stick with what I know works. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I'm in the process of just kind of implementing, you know, my strategies and um, my expectations of, you know, how are we going to get to where we need to be um, with some of our, you know, our guest experience scores. Mm -hmm. um, it's challenging though. I mean, I, I would admit, um, and I know a lot of people know this, I'm not saying anything that's surprising. It's a different, it's a different environment right now. It's a different guest, uh, especially here in South Florida. And so there are new challenges that come up every day. Um, and you have to, you have to look at things differently. And, um, I, I, you know, I never, I never know what each day is going to bring. But again, that's why I like being a GM. Beautiful. Chris, I have one question for Ryan. It's, I'm kind of probably setting him up, but uh -oh. the, the, good way or bad way. Oh, we're gonna find not, a bad, not a bad way. That's not my nature. Uh, well, how, how important do you think uh, strong guardrails are or guidelines for how your associates handle day to day business are to a great culture? I guess the importance of having a, a strong fence around what needs to be done. So I don't know if I have it here. Um, I do. I got visual aids. Excellent. <laughs> So I do, I do two things whenever I take over uh, a hotel. The first one is I meet with the leadership team and I go over my expectation document mm -hmm. and it's one page back and forth. Um, and I, I literally, it, it's me setting the parameters of the game and there's things right. on here. like Party Chapter three, you're set the bar, <laughs> set the bar. Exactly. And there's things on here. Um, I think we talked about this, uh, off and, and backstage. Let me find it real quick. Um, well, I can't find it, but there's things on here like as leaders, we shed basic rights. Mm -hmm. And one of the biggest things, rights that we shed is we no longer get to have a bad day. Right. We don't. And, uh, you know, we can in this office, we can shut the door and we can hash it out and we can cry and we can hug. And Lord knows we've already done some of that. Mm -hmm. But once we go out there as leaders, it's it's on. Right. So yep. there's stuff like that in here. There's stuff in here. I'm very big on um, quality of life. So I put in here, there's something in here where I say, um, 
that I'm not impressed by. Uh, I appreciate hard work and dedication. I also value your quality of life. Do not turn a 50 hour work week into a 70 hour work week. It does not impress me. Come to the hotel, contribute to the team, go home and enjoy your time off. I think that's so important right now um, that we are making sure we are um, being intentional about sure our employees are especially our leaders, but all employees are having a balance of quality of life. Um, so that's the first thing I do to answer your question. I go through this and then um, I love doing this because by the end, everybody has like smile on their face and they're like, all right, we know what this guy's about. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing I do is um, I'm oh, I'm always surprised when people don't have service basics in place. Uh, what are the service basics? So I, I get this little card printed. I change the logo of the hotel at the top. It's not rocket science. A lot of hotels do this hotel brands, but um and this is things like I'm going to address the guest by name whenever possible. I'm going to follow the 2010 rule. I'm going to escort rather than point because I've found that you have to right. teach the basics. Now, you can't take for granted that everybody knows that when a guest ask you where the restroom is that you're supposed to take them. And particularly if you're being brought in to help turn around a, a mm -hmm. underperforming hotel, why would you assume that they know those things? So very smart way to approach it. Yeah, I think it's, I mean, you're right on, obviously. And and it's, uh, I, people always think that a great culture has to have loose ground rules and it's the exact opposite. You have to have really strong expectations. Mm -hmm. Everybody needs to know what's expected up front, what the outcome is expected to be. And then they, then they can perform within those guardrails or I call them the riverbanks. But that's, that's, it's, it's, it's important to not try and put the two together. Actually, the best cultures have very strong ideas about who they are as a company organization or a hotel. So, mm -hmm. yeah, excellent. Well, guys, we're just about out of time. All right. We still have plenty of time for this. Hey guys, go to amazon.com. <laughs> yeah, thanks for coming in today by Charles Ryan Minton, but you can just call him uh, Ryan. Just don't let his publisher know that. <laughs> Look, uh, this is my, this is my wind up here, Glenn. Yes, sir. Is, I'm ready. Oh, I'm, don't I'm, do I'm, that. Let me no. send you one. No, I no, I want to support the cause. You can uh, send me a note or something, but okay. you guys should buy this. I mean, listening Thank to you. this guy, I've been yeah. I've been doing this a long time, and uh, this is the kind of leadership and kind of guidance we need in our industry. So, Ryan, thanks so much. Oh, I got myself a signed copy here. How cool is that guy? <laughs> Very cool. <laughs> Look at that. All right, Ryan. Thank, thank you, thank guys, you for being here, man. We really appreciate it so much. That you said today is absolutely critical things that we need to hear as an industry. So, thanks for sharing, and continue good luck with the book. Thanks for coming in today, guys. Take care. Well, Chris, that was a lot of fun. Uh, I mean, right up your alley. So, yeah. well, I saw you. You said you were taking a lot of notes. What's the number one thing you're taking away from this show? Uh, I mean, just reminders. Whenever you listen to people, I mean, that you. I, I listen. I got a ton of respect for that guy. So smart. Mm -hmm. Obviously, going to crush it down there. That's a great hotel he's at, and his team's lucky to have him. But, but intentionality and signaling. That's a word I wrote down. I don't use that word very often. Yeah. But I, I, as he was talking, I was thinking about how everything we do signals something to our team, right? Mm -hmm. um, how how we hold ourselves, what kind of mood we're in that day, how we talk about expenses. It's signaling something, and and the the, fur, the further you get away from the day to day operations, like for me, if I have to be really careful, anything I say, because what does it signal? If I frown about a financial result, is that signaling? Oh boy, something's wrong with the company. Right. You, know, you just got to be really thoughtful about that. So I think it's powerful. I think he's going to obviously crush it. I'm, I just ordered the book. It's on, it'll be here tomorrow, thanks to Amazon.com. And it's amazing how they can deliver stuff so quick. <laughs> it may be here today. I don't I know. know. <laughs> well, if you're in like New York City, you can get stuff sometimes within an hour, which That's is crazy. crazy. Which crazy. reminds me, when I lived on the Upper East Side in New York City in the late 1990s, there was uh, the internet era was just happening. It was the first wave of, uh, of tech. And um, there was this great company called Cosmo.com, K-O-Z-M-O.com. And they had warehouses. They were like the um, early Netflix of the day. And you could get, you know, DVDs and VHSs delivered to your apartment within an hour. And then they expanded to like snacks and ice creams and all of that kind of stuff. It was such a great business. But then they went and they expanded all these cities that are not really messenger friendly. And the whole company went <laughs> Yeah, it broke down, broke yeah. down. That's awesome, though. I mean, early thinkers. I love that kind of stuff. Right? Great, great episode though today, Glenn. Thanks for having me. I mean, this yeah. is something I'm really passionate about, and 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 I, I mean, there's days when 
I yearn to be sitting in Ryan's chair. I love being a GM. All you GMs out there, it's the best job. I mean, it's the best. You have such an opportunity to impact your teams and literally change people's trajectory by how you lead them and teach them. So it's awesome. That's that's great. Well, uh, Chris, just uh, stick around with me to the end if you don't mind. Well, I got to do this uh, quick plug here. If you guys want to... Uh, you guys want to follow us on audio version, of course, listen to us on Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, wherever you got to find your shows. If you want to connect with Anthony and myself, find us at Anthony Hotels and Ad Traveling Glenn. And Chris, how do we find you, my friend? Super easy. Just go to ChesapeakeHospitality.com. You'll find us there. Excellent. All right, everybody. Thanks for another great week tomorrow, 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 2 p.m. Pacific. And I'll throw you guys a bone out there in uh, Mountain Time Zone, 3 p.m. for you guys. Uh, we got Friday night audit, of course. We're going to be making drinks. We're going to be having lots of laughs, having some fun to kick off the weekend. And we'll be back next week with a lot of great shows. And don't forget the week after that, I got a whole series of shows in Las Vegas focusing on all the different properties. We're going to be looking at Resorts World, a brand new resort. We're going to be looking at the brand new Virgin Hotel. Lots of fun stuff planned. Uh, Chris, I hope I survived that week. That's going to be awesome. I can't wait for it. I know. It's going to be awesome. All right, everybody. Thanks so much for being here. Remember, you've got one life, so blaze on. And Chris, you want to wrap it up in a nice bow? What's he say? Thanks for coming in today. Yeah, there you go. Love it. All right, everybody. See you tomorrow.